Well, good morning. Good to see everyone here this morning. I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20, where David had us reading for the Lord's Supper. Right before we took the memorial, David read for us 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21, and we're going to read that as we begin our lesson this morning. This morning's lesson is entitled, Ambassadors, taking our text from 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20. And as you turn there, I want you to be thinking about what it means to be an ambassador. What does it mean to be an ambassador? In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20, he says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. The context goes back to verse 18, and Paul is talking about what it means to be reconciled to God. And he's telling them, if you go back to verse 18, he says, Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, that's the therefore, is we've been entrusted with this word of reconciliation, the gospel. You're going to see that in Ephesians 6.20 in just a minute. He says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. He says, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is a fitting passage for the memorial, as David led us in, in reading, in that this was how God reconciled us to God. But because of that sacrifice on the cross, Christ's death in, in his blood reconciled man to man, as we see in Ephesians 2, Jew and Gentile. But more importantly, he reconciled man to God. Therefore, we have this reconciliation. Over in Ephesians 6 and verse 20. In Ephesians 6 and verse 20. Going all the way back to verse 18 after giving them the, the pieces of the armor of God. Paul tells them that they are to pray with all prayer and petition. Pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Over in 2 Corinthians 5.20, he says, We've been made, we, we have been entrusted with this word of reconciliation, therefore we are ambassadors. Here he says, he is, he's asking for their prayers that he might boldly speak the gospel, of which he's an ambassador in chains. So Paul says he was an ambassador to try to get people to be reconciled to God. He says he's an ambassador of the gospel. So it begs the question, what is an ambassador? Now in recent years, we might be full of thoughts of Benghazi and the ambassador that lost his life there. But what is an ambassador? What was he doing there? Looking at a, a dictionary that defines, it was a political dictionary that defines an ambassador, it says a di diplomatic official sent by one nation to another as its resident representative, an authorized messenger or representative or promoter of a specified activity. So lots of times in community organizations or even secular organizations as they make these different committees, people get this title, you're an ambassador for this committee and you're an ambassador for that committee. I remember working at KeyBank and KeyBank did the same thing. They would say, as they put different people in different jobs, and say, you're the ambassador for this function, and you're the ambassador for that. What were they meaning? They are meaning you have the authority to represent your group. On well, that case, it wasn't, they weren't representing the bank. You represent this group for this end goal to other outreaches, other uh, communities. So an ambassador of the country, he or she represents, often resides in what is called the host country. If you go back to the first meeting, it says a diplomatic official sent by one nation to another as its resident representative. What does that mean? Resident. It means that the ambassador usually lives in the country that they is the host country. Then they represent their country to that host country, and they do so even by living there. So then after understanding what an ambassador is, what are the roles or duties of ambassadors? Well, I did a search. I was looking for... I was driving along, and all of a sudden, this passage, I had been mulling this passage over, and all of a sudden, I thought, you know, when I get home, I'm going to Google the roles of an ambassador, and I bet 
it's going to fall in line with what we do. And I already had some passages in mind. And as I looked this up, I went to a couple different sources, and I named a few of those on the outline for you, but I went through a bunch of different resources. And as I looked at the role of ambassadors, passages were just popping in my mind. Perhaps they will for you as well as we look at these. The first thing that I found, it was either called ceremonial or representation. I went with the representation aspect of it. One of the first roles of an ambassador is representation. They represent their country to the host country in which they reside. They do so and as being a public symbol of that country. They, are, they make themselves highly visible. They attend public functions. They, they are seen as the representative for their country. And so it's very, it's very important for the ambassador to conduct himself in such a way that puts his country, his or her country, in a positive light. And we see that policy is the second role of ambassadors. They relay their country's policies and decisions to the host country. And it's very interesting, I found an exact quote that says, they must follow their country's policies at all times, even if they do not agree with it on a personal level. So to be an ambassador into this host country, they have to follow their country's policies even when they don't personally agree with it. Even when they don't like it, they have to relay and follow their country's policies no matter what. They don't have the right to change their country's policies, but they have to relay it, follow it, and enforce it. And protecting citizens. I read several times in different sources that talk about political things, and one source was said that they, they had worked in politics for 27 years and had worked as an aide to a couple different ambassadors, and they said this was an important aspect of an ambassador's function. The ambassador's function is to oversee the protection and the safety of citizens in foreign countries, namely the foreign country in which they reside. Their job as being they are the top ranking official in that country's embassy, or in that, the host country's embassy for their nation, for the, the ambassador's nation, they are to oversee the protection and the safety of their citizens. And then there's the humdrum function of the ambassadors. Administrative. In all the different places I found this listed, they said this is the, 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 what makes up the most of the ambassador's day, the day-to-day -day stuff that happens. And they said that ambassador's function is to work with operations at the embassy with other diplomats and staff members. And an exact quote from one of the sources I found, it says, plenty of mundane duties fall to an ambassador's lot means that there are days that nothing is going on. But they, there's day-to-day -day stuff that still has to happen, and they still work very closely with the people and their staff. Now, as you're thinking about an ambassador and their roles, I was thinking of Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. Here is where Peter is in the household of Cornelius, and as he's telling them who Jesus is, he says, you know some things that happened. So in verse 38, he says, You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Now think about that. Peter's telling Cornelius, You know of Jesus of Nazareth. You know how he went about doing good. Now remember what an ambassador does. An ambassador represents the country that sent him to represent them. Jesus went about doing good, it says. But Jesus also told his followers in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Jesus said his disciples should do good works. Peter lets us know in Acts 10, 38, that it's no wonder that he expects it of his disciples. It's what Jesus himself did. God designed through the church. You see in Ephesians 3.10, we looked at this a couple weeks ago as we talked about the mystery of Christ. Paul said that through the church, God lets the manifold wisdom of God be known to all the rulers and authorities and even in the heavenly places. So God designed through the church that after Jesus left the earth, little Jesuses, if you would, would be found in every country, in every home, in every business and workplace, in every community, city, and village. Look with me in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 and see what Paul said about his life in relationship to this concept or this idea that we represent Jesus. He said in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, 
I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. God designed the church to be a way that we would represent Jesus to the world. That through the church, his wisdom would be let known to all the authorities and powers. Paul tells us how that happens. Because I give up my will. I give up what pleases me in order that Christ might live in me. That what I do in the flesh, I live for the Son of God. Not for what pleases me, not my ambitions any longer. But that it is Christ that lives in me. That is how we become representatives of Jesus. Saints are called Christians. Designating them as followers of Christ. Or it's also been defined as Christ-like. So we see that Christians are Christ's ambassadors on earth. And these four roles that we talked about of the ambassador, you're going to see we have all four of those roles as ambassadors for Christ on earth. The first of which was representation, as we talked about. While an ambassador, in the physical sense, represents a country or a nation and their goals to the foreign nation in which they reside, saints represent Christ and his will. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, it's a short passage, but it tells us what our goal in life is. It says, be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. So Paul says, as far as I am an imitator of Christ, you imitate me. But we also see in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1. In Ephesians 5 and verse 1. He says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Lest anyone should say, Well, Paul's not really around anymore. We can't see that example. So we can't really be imitators of Paul anymore. No, he says, Be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. Then he says, Be imitators of God as beloved children. The children ought to reflect the Father. That's what he's saying. The children ought to reflect the Father. I've mentioned to you many times something that always stuck with me as I entered into the workforce. Uh, at 16, when I got my first job, my dad took me aside and told me, you represent this family. When you go out, you represent this family. You represent my reputation. You bear my name. Don't do it lightly. And I thought, wow, I didn't think of that. But here he sends me onto the workforce and he says, when they see you, they should see me and my reputation. You represent this family. That's what Paul is saying about Christians and the family of God. Be imitators of God as beloved children. He says, as children, you need to reflect the Father. Jesus says, or Peter told Cornelius, Jesus went about doing good and healing all that came to him that were oppressed by the devil. Jesus says, do good works that men might see it and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We are to be imitators of Christ in God. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, and Matthew 5, 16, as we just looked there, Christ did good works, and he wants his saints to do good works. There are many passages that speak about this. In Ephesians 2, 10, we're told that we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. In Titus 2, verses 7 and 14, in verse 7, Paul told Titus he was to be an example of good deeds. And then in verse 14, where it talks about Jesus redeemed us so that we would be a people of his own possession. What kind of people? Zealous for good deeds or good works. In Titus 3, verse 1, verse 8, and verse 14, the theme in all, of the, in all three of these passages is in verse 14 where Paul tells Titus, our people must also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs. You see the running theme here? Jesus did good. He expects his disciples to do good. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works. Titus was to be an example of good works. All Christians are to be zealous for good works. And as we read through Titus chapter 3 and see the theme overwhelmingly, is that we are to engage in good works so that pressing needs will be met. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, we're told that Christ is the exact representation of the Father's nature. He says and He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the word of His power. When He had made purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And why do we read this? How does this fit in? If Christ was the exact representation of God, 
So over and over throughout the Gospels, when, they, when the disciples and the apostles got caught up in the moment, they would say, Lord, show us the Father. And he said, have I been with you so long you don't know the Father? As you see me, you know the Father. So the Hebrew writer says, Christ was the exact representation of God's nature. So when we see Christ, when we understand his compassion, his love, his mercy, his willingness to sacrifice for us, we see God. We see God the Father. And so, with that in mind, Christ being the exact representation of His Father, as saints, we are to be the exact representation of Christ. We bear the name Christian. That's Christ-like, a follower of Christ. So Colossians 3.17 says, Saints, whether in word or deed, are to do all things in the name of the Lord Jesus. In the word or deed, we're to do all things in the name of the Lord. Giving thanks to God, the Father, through Him. This brings me to Matthew 5.16 and Philippians 2.15. Matthew 5.16, as we read, Jesus said we're to let our light shine. We are to do good works. Philippians 2.15, Paul told the Philippians they were already letting their light shine in a perverse and crooked and dark world. He says they were letting their light shine. We represent Christ to others in word or deed. In that sense, we represent Christ. When others see our life, when they hear the things that we say and they see the things that we do, we need to be representing Christ. As ambassadors for Christ and the gospel, as Paul said, we are ambassadors to the, to the world for Christ. Therefore, we represent Christ to others. The second role of an ambassador was policy. Remember that? So while an ambassador in a physical sense relays their representative's country's policies to the host nation, what is our duty as saints? As ambassadors for Christ, we have the same goal as far as policy goes. We, in a spiritual sense, must adhere to the doctrine or teaching of Christ. And as we see in so many places, we do not have the authority to tamper it, to change it, to water it down, to mix it to our will so it sounds a little more pleasing. No, an ambassador doesn't have that right. They have to relay it completely. That country puts a lot of trust in that ambassador that lives in that foreign country. Do they not? Because they know that ambassador has certain things they have to live by. Christ puts a lot of trust in us. When Paul says we are ambassadors for the gospel, we are ambassadors for this word of reconciliation, there's a lot of responsibility that goes into that. In 1 Peter 4, verse 11, gives us our marching orders, so to speak. He says, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances or the oracles of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We often read this and just focus on that whoever speaks is to speak as the utterances of God. But this whole passage deals with representing God. Look at it. When we speak, we're to speak as his oracles or his utterances. Whoever serves isn't to serve so that they can pat themselves on the back and, and, throw and show off their ability. No, it says whoever serves is serving by the strength which God supplies so that in all things God is glorified, not the servant. When an ambassador relays those messages to the foreign country, it is the leader of that country whose name is glorified or brought down because of the ambassador's actions. Rarely do we remember an ambassador's name, but we remember the leaders of the countries that the ambassador represents, right? Because it's the ambassador's job to glorify the nation in which he represents. You see that as Christians, we're to do the same. We speak as Christ would have us speak. We serve as Christ would have us serve. And that in all things in our life, we bring glory to God. And we represent Him to others. Just to give you a few examples of things that we can look at in the Scriptures as far as this policy aspect goes. In Acts 20 and verse 27, Paul told the elders of Ephesus on the Isle of Miletus, he said he, when he was with them, he didn't shrink back from declaring to them the whole counsel of God, reading from the New King James, to the Ephesians. You go back to verse 17 of that passage and you find he's talking to the elders of Ephesus on the Isle of Miletus. But he says when he was with them, he did not shrink back 
from declaring the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. In Titus chapter 2, 1 and verse 7, and this is a passage I wanted you to read with me. In Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 7. In verse 6, he says, Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. So that, verse 7, In all things show yourself, who? The letters written to Titus. Show yourself to be an example of good deeds, with purity and doctrine dignified. We talked earlier that he was to be an example of good deeds, but part of those good deeds was to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine. That means teaching. Purity and teaching. That means that what he was to teach was to be pure. It was to be from God. He was not to mix in his own thoughts, his own opinions. He was to have purity of doctrine. Also, in verse, if you go back to verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine, sound teaching. He says, Speak the things that are fitting for sound doctrine. In verse 1, in verse 7, he says, Be an example of good works with purity of doctrine. There are people today that think that what they're doing is pure and good works. But it's good works not mingled with pure doctrine. It's the doctrine of what they've come up with, what there was pleasing to them, what how they are pleased in pleasing God. And it's not about what pleases us in pleasing God. It's about us doing what pleases God. Remember what it said about an ambassador in a physical sense? They relay and follow their country's policies even if they do not personally agree with it. As Christians, even if it's not what we want to say to someone else, we don't have the right to change or alter the word of God. We have to say what needs to be said. And sometimes that gets us in an unpleasant or awkward situation. You think the job of an ambassador is going to be awkward and unpleasant at times? Well, you know that it is. We know that it is. So think of our lives as Christians and being in this role as ambassadors. And then think about those who do not do that. Galatians chapter 1, 6 to 9. Paul said there were those already bothering the church at Galatia, teaching a different gospel, which wasn't a different gospel, but a perversion, and was troubling them. And then he says, if an apostle, if any man, or even an angel from heaven, change the word of God and teach something different, they are to be accursed. Those who teach a different doctrine, different gospel, are accursed. In 2 John... 9 to 11. Those who leave the doctrine of Christ, it says, no longer have God or the Son. They no longer have the Father or the Son. He says, if anyone goes too far and no longer abides in the doctrine of the teaching of Christ, he no longer has the Father or the Son. What, why not? What does that mean? They no longer represent him. That's what it means. They no longer represent him. They no longer represent him, his policy, his goals, his will for their lives. They've created their own righteousness. They've created their own doctrine and they're glorifying themselves when they teach it. So many people today, when they different denominations, what do we think of? John Calvin, he lived in the 1500s and yet his name is still glorified because people still teach the once saved, always saved doctrine. That's not from Christ. They're glorifying John Calvin and many others whose names are glorified above Christ's. Because mankind has turned to them. And here's the thing we need to think about when it comes to policy or purity of doctrine. Just as an ambassador who no longer abides by the policy of the nation he represents will be replaced. Anyone who teaches differently will be accursed. Paul said anyone who teaches something different will be accursed. We don't have the right as ambassadors for Christ on earth to change or water down the message, to teach something that might be a little more pleasant to the ears. That's what Paul said apostasy was going to come from in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and 2 Timothy chapter 4. People that were no longer wanting to endure sound doctrine. And yet we can see in Titus chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul made sure to tell Titus, endure sound doctrine. Be an example with purity of doctrine. So we see the plan of salvation as we call it as delivered by Jesus. In John 5, 24, he said they are to hear the word of God. In Luke 13, 16, 18, Jesus said they needed to believe in order to have eternal life. In Luke 13, 3 through 5, he said they need to repent 
in Matthew 10, 32, he said, you are to confess him before men in order to be confessed by, the, by him to the Father. In Mark 16, 16, he said that we need to combine belief with obedience. We need to believe and be baptized in order to be saved. And in John 8, 31, he said we need to abide in his word. We need to be obedient. As ambassadors, we are unable to alter or insert our opinions to the word of God, but rather we are to teach the gospel because it is the word of truth that can save souls. We see this in Colossians 1, 5 and James 1, 21. Colossians 1.5 talks about it being the word of truth. James 1.21 says that word implanted is able to save your souls. What happens when we alter it? When we change it? When we water it down? When we fill it with our opinions? It's no longer the word of truth. And if it's no longer the word of truth because we've altered it, it's no longer the word that can save souls. As ambassadors, we cannot alter or insert our opinions. But we must teach it with purity of doctrine as Paul instructed Titus to do. And the third thing we see is our jobs as ambassadors is protection. How does this fit into our lives as Christians? We know we don't fight against flesh and blood. We know our struggle is spiritual. So how did this fit? Well, read this with me. While ambassadors are responsible for the safety of their citizens in the host country, saints are residing in foreign territory and they look for the spiritual safety of souls. Think of this in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. He says our citizenship is in heaven. It says our citizen for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we know that our citizenship is in heaven, the song that we sang this morning is, is led by Keith, this world is not our home. This world is not my home. But yet we reside here. Why? Because we're ambassadors. Think of that. An ambassador lives in the country, the host country, that he's representing his country to. We're not, we're not citizens of this world. Once we become Christians, we change our citizenship. And now our citizenship is in heaven. But yet we are still here until the time comes that we are called home. In John 15, I'm sorry, John 17, verse 15, and 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 11, look at this idea playing out that this world is not our home. In John chapter 17 and verse 15, this is what I would consider the real Lord's Prayer, not the model prayer that we read about in Matthew 6. But this is the Lord's Prayer, and the night in which he's betrayed, he's sitting in the garden, he took three of his disciples, his best friends, and he told them to keep watch with him while he prayed. And over and over he finds them sleeping. And he prays, but he's praying on their behalf. And then he prays for on behalf of those who had come after their word. But he says in verse 15, in verse 14, he says, I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Verse 15, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. Now, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 9. So Jesus prayed and said he wanted them he wanted them to be kept from the evil one but he rep he recognized that in order for them to be completely safe from the evil one they would have to be removed from the world and that wasn't Jesus's prayer Jesus said please save them you know keep them safe they have to be in the world here's how Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 9 I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people I did not mean at all with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters. For then you would have to go out of the world. And then he says, but actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother. If he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. But notice what Paul said. Paul says the only way for you not to associate with people like that is to be completely taken out of the world. Now, there are those who go to the extreme, and they separate themselves from the world as far as it's possible. Think of the Amish. They, set the, they separate themselves out as completely as possible. They're not being lights in their community. They're not being ambassadors for Christ to the host country. They've separated themselves out of it. Paul says it's impossible. He says the only way to do that is to be completely removed from the world, and that's not what he meant. Jesus recognized that. Paul recognized that. What it tells us is we are to live in the world, but not be part of the world. 
We see this in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, where God reiterates to Christians, as he once did to Israel, come out of their midst and be separate, says the Lord Almighty. Remember that? And then I will be your God, and you will be my sons and my daughters. He says, come out of their midst and be separate. We are to live in the world, but not be part of the world. That's what an ambassador does. When an ambassador lives in that host country, they might live there, they might reside there, but that's not their people. Their people are the country they represent. Right? Not the people that are hosting them. So they are there as a guest, as a visitor. Peter puts this. In 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12, he says, Saints are aliens and strangers, and therefore we are to keep our behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Why? Because we represent Christ. We represent God. And so we are to keep our behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Here's another passage that I like. In 2 Corinthians 5, 10 to 11. In 2 Corinthians 5, 10 to 11. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, what's the therefore, therefore? It's there to tell us that because we know there's a judgment day. He says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord. What's the fear of the Lord? That one day there's a terrible judgment day where we're going to be judged for the good and the bad that we have done. We're going to be judged. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. All, the great and the small. Jesus points this out in Matthew 25, starting in verse 31. The great and the small will be gathered together. So he says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest to God. And I hope we're made manifest also in your consciences. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Paul saying the motive behind teaching the gospel to those who are lost. Because there is a judgment day coming. And he says that because we know that, we persuade men. We teach them so that they don't have to face it without a mediator. Christ, as we see in Romans chapter 8. And in 1 Peter, or I'm sorry, in 2 Timothy 2, 24-26, we're told that we teach the gospel to help men escape the snare of the devil. It says being held captive by him to do his will. He says as bondservants of the Lord, we are to be able to teach. Why? So that we can help someone escape the snare of the devil if they want to escape. The sad thing is because it's spiritual, we can't just take them by the hand and force them out of the trap, out of the snare. They have to want it. There has to be a conscientious effort in their heart to change their hearts. To say, I have sinned. I'm in need of that Savior that paid the price for my debt on Calvary. What do I do? Like the Jews on the day of Pentecost. We teach the gospel to help men escape the snare of the devil. In 1 Peter 3, 3 through 5, we read that saints have an inheritance reserved in heaven. That's why we persuade men. We want them to have that inheritance in heaven. As ambassadors, we teach the gospel in order to, for souls to secure their inheritance in heaven. We teach the gospel so that we might save souls. And the fourth thing we looked at in the physical sense of the job or role of an ambassador was the administrative, he said, mundane, the ho-hum, day-to-day life of an ambassador. So the administrative, how does, that, how does that apply to us? Well, in the physical sense, while ambassadors work with their staff to accomplish the mundane tasks associated with their day-to-day jobs, Christians, we work not only the day-to-day in our own lives, but we work with one another to, as members of the body of Christ. In Romans chapter 12, 4 through 5, we read, Just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. We also see this. You can also see this in 1 Corinthians 12, 11 through 31. And in verse 12, it says many members, but one body. Just as we read there in Romans 12. I want us to stay in the Romans 12 passage though because I want you to look in verse 6 Romans 12 and verse 6 we read 4 and 5 just now and in verse 6 he says since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us each of us is to exercise them accordingly remember what Jesus taught about the man that just buried what he was given and didn't use it 
He says, when we are given these different gifts, we have these different talents and abilities, he says, we use them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportions of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved. But leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. These, these things that we just read, the things that we do individually, the things we do collectively with one another, as members of the body of Christ, many members, but one body. These make up the day-to-day -day of our lives. These make up the day-to-day -day of our lives no matter who we're, we're representing Christ to. No matter if we're at work doing our job, we need to do it heartily. We need to do it and be the best employee that employer has. We, if we go to school, as our other students see us and interact with us, we need to have these traits, have them in mind. They ought to see these things in our lives. Our families, who see us every day, need to see these things in our lives. We're to use the abilities that we've been given and be devoted to each other in the work that we've been given. It said, serving the Lord in that list. These, these encompass all the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Also in Ephesians 4, 14 to 16, we're told the body is to build itself up in love, and it says, by what every joint supplies means when we come together, when we are the body of Christ, we need to be using everything that we've been given to further the goal of Christ. To persuade men, to teach the gospel, to edify and exhort and build one another up. And it says that we build each other up in love. In Colossians 3, 12 to 15, I want to thank Jerry for the scripture reading this morning and ask you to read it with me again. So as those who've been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. And then in verse 16. He says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15 and 2 Peter 3, 18. Not only do we see in this passage in Colossians 3 that we are to love one another, we are to forgive one another, we are to work with one another. The other individual goal that we have is we are to study and grow in the knowledge of Christ. We do this individually and we do it when we come together collectively as a group. That's why we set up the different studies that we have. That we might sharpen iron against iron. That we might help one another to know the Word of God. That we might know how to present the Word of God. That we might know how to persuade men. We do this together. We do it by studying and growing in the knowledge of Christ. As ambassadors for Christ, we're to live day to day, being Christ-like and doing His will. That's what these passages show in Colossians 3. This makes up the day to day of our lives, the, the kind of attitudes and traits and virtues that we are to have, that we are to espouse to all those around us, whoever they are. As we conclude, we see there is a great responsibility in being an ambassador for Christ, just as there is in the physical world, 
In the physical realm, there's a responsibility of being an ambassador and representing the nation to the host, your nation to the host nation. In Colossians 3, 16 to 17, as we just looked at, we must speak and act as he would have us. As ambassadors, we're to remember we represent Christ here on earth. And where we go, what we do, and what we say, others ought to see Christ in us. As we see there in Matthew 5 and 16. As we let our light shine, others see the good works, the good deeds that we're doing, and it brings them to their knees to glorify the Father, our Father who is in heaven. And as Paul said that he's crucified and Christ lives in him, the question this morning is, does the world around you see Jesus in you? When they look at you, do they see a little Jesus, so to speak? Do they see Jesus in you and your can you be characterized as Christ like? Well, as Christians, we ought to be Christ like. We ought to be seen as followers of Christ. So my admonition this morning and encouragement is to think of our lives as ambassadors. We are living in a foreign land. As those ambassadors in a foreign land, we represent Jesus to the world. We represent Jesus to the world in order that we might save all who will obey the gospel. As we ourselves eagerly wait for our Savior to return where we'll be with Him forever. As we saw there in Philippians 3.20 and 1 Thessalonians 4.17 that says we'll always be with the Lord. This morning, if you're not a Christian, you need to be. To repent and be baptized in His name knowing that you as a non-Christian, as a non-believer, you belong to the world. And the world loves its own. You can change that. You can change your citizenry by hearing the word of God, by repenting, by being baptized into his name, rising out of the water as a child of God, <coughs> whose citizenship is in heaven, and become an ambassador to the world around you. If you are a Christian this morning in error, don't wait till it's eternally too late to change. But remember, you are an ambassador. You represent Christ. Christ has called on mankind to repent. And if we can't show the world that we can repent of our sins, why on earth should they repent of their sins? We need to have that humility of heart, no matter how young or mature a Christian we are, that we can seek forgiveness when we make mistakes. If, we, if you are subject to an invitation in any way this morning, we stand ready to assist you, whether the waters of baptism or the prayers of the congregation on your behalf. Know that you don't have to struggle with whatever it is you struggle with alone. We can assist you. Come forward and let your Christ be made known while we stand and while we sing.